Welcome to the Luke Messias Show. It has been a week since the election, a little over a week, but that's okay. Who's counting? Um, the election where conservatives won substantial amounts of races in the State Board of Education on the county chair level. I don't know if I mentioned Montgomery County, Williamson County, Grayson County, uh, Cameron County, just across the board, we had some awesome county chairs, GOP county chairs elected. Uh, so the Republican Party of Texas continues to move to the right internally, as well as legislatively, as well as on the education side. And of course, our Court of Criminal Appeals victories that we had. So great election night for conservatives. If you didn't watch or listen to last week's episode, go back and I kind of overview a lot. I will correct one thing. From last week, the Kerr County group of conservatives who are organized and dominating there in Kerr County, their uh, name, if you're looking for them and in that area, is Liberty in Action Kerr County or Kerr County Liberty in Action. I told them they, they should have shortened their name so I could remember it better. So I blame them because the Kerr County Patriots not is not their group. But Liberty in Action Kerr County or Kerr County Liberty in Action. All that being said, if you're in Kerr County, search Liberty in Action, engage with those guys. They're doing awesome work. They're incredible. And they're on the front lines of, of keeping Texas red and moving Texas to the right. So I'm very grateful for the work that they're doing there. Um, I don't think I mentioned the Mark LaHood victory last week, which I will mention. This is something really worth noting. Mark LaHood defeated Steve Allison. Now, this is House District 121. I have a lot of experience in House District 121. I ran the first cam campaign against Joe Strauss in 2012, which was my friend Matt Beebe, and uh, still a friend of mine today. And he ran three times for that seat. Um, Jeff Judson ran for that seat. Uh, Sheila Bean ran for that seat. These are all friends of mine. Uh, House District 121 has been a moderate stronghold, both in Speaker Strauss's era and then handing the baton off to Steve Allison. And so the district where Joe Strauss came from, which kind of seems ironic since that's the district which a lot of this sourced from. I mean, the original Democrat Republican coalition in the Texas House that we're going to break down a lot for you today um, was there. And House District 121 uh, was in uh, the middle of it and the thick of it. Anyways, we're going to cover a lot for you today. And my intro has been a little longer than normal. But let's get to the show. I literally stood polls in House District 121. I, you know, when you're a consultant, you run out of stuff to do. And so when I was running a bunch of campaigns, you'd run out of things to do like four or five days before the election. So the last two days of the election, you had no more mail, no more stuff. So I would just go stand polls. And I would stand polls with either Representative Lyle Larson, who'd be standing polls for Joe Strauss or Joe Strauss himself. Had a number of days where I sat for 10 hours with Joe Strauss talking to voters one on one. I personally think there is almost nothing more exciting in Texas politics than standing at a poll, literally flipping undecided voters with like the actual candidates there. I was seeing pictures of like Dade Phelan and David Covey were both at the same location in Beaumont. Un voters walking up, shaking their speaker of the Texas House's hand, shaking the guy who's running against him, talking to both of them, not sure who he's going to vote for, goes in, casts a ballot. Uh, the only other thing that kind of compares with that is like a local candidate forum where both candidates show up. They each have like 100 friends in the room. There's maybe 150 undecided people and they just go at it. People are like yelling at each other in the crowd. I'm telling you, there's only a couple things. It's hard to get more exhilarating than standing at the polls, talking to voters. I mean, even Speaker Strauss at the time. And one of the things I've said about Speaker Strauss is he he was a very pleasant person to be around. OK, we completely fundamentally disagreed ideologically on the direction of the state of Texas, on the importance of protecting human life in the womb and other very basic things. OK, so uh, I won't take away from that, but he was just a very pleasant person to be around. There's a reason he did a good job getting reelected. Um, he was not antagonistic in his demeanor. And so these voters would walk up and we would talk to one and the other. They'd go in and he'd be like, I think you probably won that one. And then I'd go, I think they're with you. They're wearing loafers. You know, you're wearing loafers. They're probably a loafer voter. Um, but all that being said, Mark LaHood's victory uh, on election night was a big victory for conservatives because Mark 
is somebody who has said he opposes Democrat chairs, has said he knows things have to change in the chamber, is on board with school choice, is going to work with the governor, with the lieutenant governor, with the attorney general, with the agriculture commissioner, not, and with the Republican Party of Texas. And that's the opposite of what a lot of House leadership does. Dustin Burroughs, Greg Bond, and these other people, they're working against the Republican Party of Texas. They're poking the eye of the attorney general, lieutenant governor, ag commissioner. So it's really... Uh, a huge testimony to all the grassroots in Bear County who flipped Lyle Larson's seat to Mark DeRazio two years ago and now flipped Joe Strauss's seat and Steve Allison's seat to Mark LaHood. I don't think I mentioned him uh, last week when I did my overview of the whole state. So today, though, we are going to talk about House leadership's decision to... <clears throat> House leadership's decision to dig in their heels. Now, I will tell you, I think the vast majority of the Republican caucus realizes that what happened on election night is substantial and is likely going to change the culture in the Texas House. But Dennis Bonin, so if y'all are wondering, this is like an insidery thing, but I'll kind of explain to you. There's this Bonin crew now, Dade Phelan's team has different cardinals, and they don't all like each other or love each other or work real closely together. But his most powerful group of cardinals underneath him is the leftover Bonin crew. It's Dustin Burroughs as calendar's chairman. It's uh, Greg Bonin as the appropriations chairman, Dennis Bonin's brother. Remember, Dennis Bonin was the speaker who had to leave in as a scandal erupted, and he lied to all the members. And so Greg Bonin, of course, is the appropriate Cody Harris. Um, Brad Buckley is maybe with this group. I don't know, but a lot of people think he is. Tom Oliverson is kind of with this group. And then they have their like under lieutenants in this group. It's like Jared Patterson and Lacey Hole and Matt Shaheen, uh, Cole Hefner, Cody Vasut, Lacey Hole, uh, Carl Tepper. These are like different people that would be kind of hardcore loyalists to this group of individuals. And they do not want the Texas House to stop working in in a cohesive manner with Democrats. Most of them pay a gentleman named Jordan Berry, who's also paid by Dade Phelan, um, and, and they're paid by Jordan Berry to be their consultant. So Jordan consults a lot of these people. And then he also Jordan also works for Texans for Lawsuit Reform, kind of the main group that tried to oust uh, our attorney general. So this Bonin crew is doing everything they can to figure out how they maintain all of their power, okay? Um, they did it with Dennis. Dennis left, and they were able to go in with Dade and still keep all their positions. So Dennis Bonin, who's also kind of... So outside of the members, the two probably leaders within that group are Jordan Berry and Dennis Bonin. And, um, and Dennis had a problem in that three weeks ago, he accepted this new gig on Spectrum News. And it was basically being a political commentator once a week from the outside looking into Texas politics. Okay. So it's him and Mark Strama, who's a former Democrat state representative. He actually was a sophomore when my dad was a freshman. So I remember him quite prominently there in the legislature. And throughout his tenure, he was always highly respected, got a lot done. He was a little bit more of like a pro business, moderate Democrat. Um, People in Hayes County will disagree with me. They're like, no, he was really a liberal. But but as on the spectrum of Democrats, he was always a little bit more of a moderate pro-business Democrat. So Mark Strama um, and Dennis Bonin once a week have to go in and talk about the tex Texas politics. And this provided a real problem for Dennis because all of a sudden the election results come in and a bunch of his friends and the kind of corrupt regime loses a lot of races. And so normally what somebody like Dennis or Jordan Berry or all these various different reps would do is just kind of hide for a while. Don't say anything. Let it settle. Let everyone know it's going to be normal. Dennis's problem is he can't like cancel his TV appearance, right? He probably signed a contract or something and said, I'll do this. So now he's got to go on. And we are going to go to a clip of Dennis talking about um, him and Mark Strama talking about the election and potentially the uh, the aftermath effects. OK, so let's go to this clip. The argument on the first day of session last session was we should be more like D.C. We should not have a speaker elected with support from the minority party and we should not have minority party 
members serving as committee chairs. That failed badly at the beginning of last session. I worry that that will have more momentum this session. You don't think so? I don't think it will. Well, I, I mean, will. what's your take on that? Um, I think if, if the Republicans um, are smart, one of the greatest things that makes Texas better than Washington every day of the week is the fact that everyone has a chance to be heard in that body. And more importantly, how you make sure you don't get treated like Kevin McCarthy did in Washington, D.C., is that you leave Democrats interested in working with you. And so if you look at what happened Tuesday night, where we're headed, you're going to have 25 freshman Republicans, it looks like, in the Texas House. So if you say Democrats, take your things and go home. I want to stop it there for a second, and we'll we'll come back to this clip in, in just a minute. But understand what Dennis Bond just said, a couple interesting things that you have to understand. First of all, he talks about the fact that Kevin McCarthy could have been a bad, moderate, swampy speaker for as long as he wanted if he had just figured out how to get Democrats on board with his agenda. Duh. Like, here's what I love. Here's what I love about this clip and the subsequent clips I'm going to show you guys. Dennis Bonin is basically like, Everyone who has criticized us in the Texas House is right, okay? So Cole Hefner and Jared Patterson and even, even honestly, like a lot of members of the Freedom Caucus, Valerie Swanson, Cody Vesuper, Cocaine, and who knows what where are they all going to end up in this? Because a lot of members, I'll get to that in a second, I'll come back to this, but I will, I will say right now, a lot of Republican members, just because you've disagreed with somebody last session doesn't mean you're going to disagree with them about where the Texas House goes. So some people who were diehard loyalists, to that group could leave, okay? But they've all said, we followed the caucus rules. The Republicans nominated Dennis Bonin. The Republicans nominated Dade Phelan. And I have told all of you who will listen to this program, that is a lie. The Texas Heist, the most successful documentary in Texas politics history, says they teamed up with Democrats, okay? And all of the under lieutenant, now Dennis never said this, but Cody and Cole and all these people. No, the, the, the caucus picked him. The caucus picked him. Okay. And what Dennis Bonin is literally now admitting because he's trying, he's in like salvage mode is like, no, the Republican caucus never picked me. The Republican caucus never picked Dade. It was always a group of Republicans and Democrats. Okay. And by the way, then he reiterates, if you can figure out how to keep the Democrats interested in your speakership, you don't have to worry about the conservatives. Okay. That's what he is saying. Oh, and he'll continue to reiterate it. So let's go back. Why would a Democrat vote for a Republican speaker? Let the Republicans have chaos. But if the Republicans say, but you can still have a chairmanship and you can still be treated with respect and you can still have your voice heard here as we've done forever, the Democrats have a reason to support that speaker. And so then the Republican speaker can be elected with 50, 60 Republicans, 20, 25 Democrats. And those on the extreme sides of both parties, quite candidly, in the House can yell and scream and bark at each other why that 80, 90 reasoned good people want to represent their district go govern. So you, I obviously 100 percent agree with the. So realize he, he just laid out, OK, we have this uniparty system. And he, of course, paints it like they only have 25 Democrats. They have a lot more than 25 Democrats on board with the uniparty system. But he, he couldn't say 50 Republicans and 75 Democrats, right, which is really what it is. But he's not going to say that. There might It's not 75 Democrats because there's not 75 Democrats. But um, the, the point is he's not going to say 50-50. 50, 50. 50 Republicans and 50 Democrats. And then we don't have to worry about like the 10 Democrats that aren't no don't know if they're on board. So he's going to say 25. That's not true. And I love that Mark Strom is like, I totally agree. That's what we should do. Okay. This is this is the broken system in the Texas House on full display on cable television. It's pure entertainment to watch. It's better than Netflix. Mark Strom is like, yeah, Dennis, go do it. Let's do that. This is the Democrat. Do you think he's saying that would be so much better for the Republican conservative principles and values and policies we have? No. Right? Let's continue. Case for having the bipartisan system we have in the Texas House historically. My point is, you've just had two occasions in this last session 
where the Republican caucus fractured, once over the issue of vouchers and once over the issue of impeaching Ken Paxton. And the price paid by the folks who deviated from the party line was high. A lot of them got defeated. Many of them are still in runoffs. It, to me, I fear, I hope you're right, but I fear that it creates a climate where enforced party orthodoxy becomes the norm in the Texas House, which yeah. it historically has not been. Yeah, I don't see that happening. It's a fair point, it's fair concern. But I want to stop there again. A fair point, a fair concern. So what Mark Strama just said is, my fear is that with the conservative victories we had on election night, Republicans might feel like they actually need to more consistently vote the way a Republican would vote. And that's what he means, the party orthodoxy, right? So it's like my fear, imagine this is like a, a Christian conversation. Like my fear is that in this church, Christians might think that they should be Christians. Like they might think that they need to actually believe that Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. That's my concern of where we're headed. That's basically what he's saying. My concern is that, oh man, it kind of hurt these, these moderates when they voted with the Democrats on these things. And so I'm concerned that because some of them lost, maybe the new Texas House is going to be one where Republicans need to start voting Republican. And what does Dennis Bonin say? It's a fair point. It's a fair concern. Like, it, this guy is like, yeah, you should be concerned about that. So if you're wondering what direction do does Greg Bonin and Dustin Burroughs and Cody Harris and all these people want to take, where do they want the Texas House to go with Dennis and their whole team? They're concerned about a Republican House that would actually think it's really good to vote Republican. Let's see what his explanation is, though. You know, Irena said it incredibly well in her open. You know, Governor Abbott was was committed to policy. He was committed to his school choice effort. Governor Abbott is not going to go do two rallies and spend money in member X's district because they had Democrat chairs. I'd be, I'd be shocked by that. So um, you make a great point. I mean, look, I've talked to a member who's in a runoff and I talked to him before he was in the runoff and he says, I took some really principled votes this time. I just hate they all had to be in one election cycle. Yeah. And so, you know, I don't think they're going to have a school choice. I don't think they're going to have an impeachment all behind one cycle next time. And more importantly, they're not going to be able to govern if they put themselves in the position of dividing the aisle, following Washington. They're, they're in trouble. Mark, I mean, I agree with you on the given so Mark again kind of goes, well, I don't know that I agree with you on much of that, but I agree with you on the Democrats part, right? Again, I want to go back to what Dennis Bonin just said in this clip. He's talking to a friend of his who's like, man, I had to take some really, quote unquote, principled votes. I just hate that they all had to be in one cycle. Here's what he's, I want, I want, to, I want to interpret this for you. Hey, I needed to stab my constituents in the back. And I really hate that Dade Phelan made me do that several times over in one session. Normally, we try to spread it out, which is true. They try to spread it out. Hey, if we're going to betray our voters, let's do it like once or twice, but not like four or five times, or in this case, like 50 times. Don't kill the bill that's going to put the Ten Commandments back in classrooms and then also kill the bill on China land and then also impeach the attorney general and also try to basically like demolish the Department of Agriculture while also insulting the lieutenant governor. Like, don't do all of that in one cycle. Oh, by the way, and then say, oh, Governor Abbott, you got school choice. Yeah, we're not doing that either. So what Dennis Bonin is saying is like, you know, the thing that stinks is that we had to take quote unquote principled stands all together. Now, then it also tells you what Dennis Bonin's principles are pure and simple. What are his principles? His principles align with those votes that are taken with the Democrats apart from conservatives. And that's what he's trying to figure out how to preserve. Now, the interview went off to several other things, but then they came back to Speaker Dade Phelan. Now, you have to understand there's this discussion about, one, whether Speaker Phelan gets elected, reelected. And uh, and at the start of the segment, Dennis Bonin says he's going to get reelected. Okay, that's what he says. He's going to get reelected. But, um, 
And he doesn't say he's going to. Let me. I think I'm putting words in his mouth if I say that. So let me let me uh, clarify this. Dennis Bonin says he can get reelected. He does say he's in danger, but then he's like he he can get reelected. He just needs to be very disciplined, and I think the people you know are there to help him. So he doesn't say he's going to get reelected, but he says he can. Um, the later on. They ask both Mark and Dennis about Speaker Phelan's chances, even if he wins re-election. Because I will tell you, even if Speaker Phelan gets re-elected, he's not going to be the Speaker next session. He's just not. He has cut up the members. He has basically made them bleed for him and his own personal vendettas. And it's not something that speaks well of a Speaker's leadership. He has depended far too much on the Democrats for his position of power, and it has put him in a position where he has to then kill tons of conservative policy that the Texas Senate passes. Um, so he's not going to be the speaker next session. But again, the Burroughs, the Bonin crew, they got to they gotta help this guy survive, right? So let's go to another clip during this same show segment where he's asked about speaker feeling. Well, yeah, I mean, you all often say it's one thing to be elected. It's another thing to get in there and govern. Um, Speaker Bonin, back on Speaker Phelan, um, if he is reelected, I mean, will the support be there to make him speaker again? Absolutely. The biggest mistake the Texas House could make, the biggest mistake Republicans in the House, Democrats in the House, particularly Republicans, though, if Dade Phelan is successful, which I think he can, in his runoff, he absolutely will be, should be, and needs to be the Speaker of the Texas House. Well, so that was a prescriptive statement. Uh, you asked a descriptive question. <laughs> will they? I want to start there. Again, Mark Strong is a very smart guy. I told you he's very likable. Um, you know, he's sitting here going, wait a second. Karina just asked you, is he, does he have the votes? And Dennis, he's in campaign mode, right? Remember, Dennis Bonin knows the cameras are on him and he's not speaking to you. He's not, we're going to later in this clip find out he's not even speaking to freshmen. In fact, his message to freshmen is very clear. He's actually speaking to the other members of the Republican caucus and he's trying to keep them on Dade's team. And so he's telling them, listen to me right now, which got the guy knows how to stick to his framing and narrative. They absolutely must, should, absolutely in no circumstance not have this guy as their speaker if he gets reelected. Okay. He's selling them. So then Strama comes in and goes, that's not what she asked you. She didn't ask you what should the Texas house do? She said, does he have the support? And we're going to continue on with this discussion. Okay. I should listen. I think, I, that's a, I think the support is still there. I, I, mean, I don't know. You know, the house is he, he, he was elected. your guy. Yeah. Yeah. He was elected after I had left the house and I, I actually don't know him. Uh, but my observation is that he has really allowed people to do something they preach a lot about in the Texas House, which is vote your yeah. district. Mm -hmm. And all the members would be well served mm -hmm. to have a speaker like that in the chair. America is at a crossroads. Now more than ever, Texas must step up and lead the country. We don't have time to mess around. The only way to save America is with a strong Texas. You and I know this, but so do the enemies of life and liberty. Therefore, you and I have no choice but to stand up and fight. I'm Sarah Gonzalez, and to the enemies of liberty, I say, come and take it. I have to stop. I have to stop here for a second. Vote your district. Now, this is something that the House, this is like one of the biggest gaslighting terms the Texas House uses, okay? So the Texas House says, hey, guys, vote your district, okay? Now, what did Dennis just say about the conversation he had with his friend in the runoff? Man, I had to take a lot of principled votes, and it really stunk because... It was all in one, and now I'm having to deal with the repercussions. What is the implication to that? The implication that Dennis Bonin made earlier was 
The thing that's really hurt these guys is the fact that they had to take all these votes that didn't line up with their district, okay? It lined up with what the people in Austin thought. Everybody around them, hey, we're impeaching the attorney general. Hey, screw school choice. Hey, blah, 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 whatever it was, okay? So he's like, it just stunk that we had to kill all these bills like China land and the Ten Commandments while we were doing these things. But then they'll say, well, you know, the best thing about Speaker Phelan is he lets the members vote their districts. Okay, here's the thing you have to understand. If there's a bill on the floor and Steve Toth gets up and offers an amendment to that bill, and this amendment makes this bill more conservative and therefore aligns more accurately with your district, okay? Members will look at it and go, oh, my people, that's what they would want. And then Craig Goldman and Dustin Burroughs and Greg Bonin and this whole crew start walking the floor and looking at members, Will Metcalf, Morgan Meyer, and saying, hey, look at me. We're voting this amendment down, right? They don't say, they don't walk around the floor and go, hey, 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 everybody vote your district. Hey, hey, guys, impeachment, everybody vote your district. Oh, they were freaking out during the impeachment because John Smithy got up and gave this great speech, one of the best speeches ever given in Texas House history. And then Clardy's questioning it. Harold Dutton, a Democrat's like, this seems like a very poorly put together plan for an impeachment. And they're working the floor like crazy. Briscoe, Cain's pulling people, Cody Vasut. And again, I will tell you, some of these guys might very well have had their eyes opened. Okay? So I just want to be clear. Like, just because somebody voted to impeach Ken Paxson doesn't mean they can't be part of a conservative coalition to restore the Texas House to actually serving the people. In fact, J.M. Lozano signed a resolution apologizing to Ken Paxton. Gary Gates put out a statement saying this was ridiculous. He then got Donald Trump's endorsement like several weeks later. I mean, one of the things conservatives, I guess I'm going to get here now and then I'll get back to this clip, but conservatives need to always be ready to work with any member, even if you've disagreed with them six months ago or a year ago. If they say, I want to be part of advancing a conservative policy agenda now and changing the culture in the Texas House, you go, awesome, let's start working together. Why not? Sometimes grassroots struggle with that. Hey, this guy was bad on issues that I care about six months ago, therefore I don't want to work with him now. And that's ridiculous. But these people were whipping the floor. And none of them were saying, and you know what? I'm going to I'm going to give Jeff Leach, Morgan Meyer, Dustin Burroughs, Greg Bonin, all these people. I'm going to give you all the opportunity right now. If at any point any of y'all want to go on social media or post or do your own show or come on this show and say that you told members during impeachment just vote your district. I would love to hear it. But that did not happen. None of y'all walked around the House floor and said, hey, 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 vote your district. Just vote how your district wants. It was, let me be clear, this is a speaker vote. There are people that voted against impeachment that have already been telling people, oh, look, I'm going to tell you right now, if, if he can, I don't even know if I'm going to be on a committee. That's how bad it is. There were dozens that voted against it. So vote, voting your district is a farce. It's a fake term they use. They don't do it. Let's get back to what Dennis Bonin has to say about Dave Phelan keeping his speakership. I just worry, look, you, it goes back to the same question about whether there will be a new challenge to having minority party committee chairs and minority party support for the speaker. If it becomes a fulcrum, the way vouchers became a fulcrum mm -hmm. and the way Paxton became a fulcrum, if it if the if the big money and the big machines uh, start to make that start to whip up the base around it, I just think it's going to be a lot harder for people to hold the hold on to their principles. I, I think I think it's going to be harder for people to hold on to their principles. Again, remember what. What Dennis Bond and Mark Stromer are saying is the principles of the Republicans in the Texas House that are part of leadership are that they need to work with Democrats. They need to give them power. Okay. 
Those are the principles. So if they vote to ban Democrat chairs, which 88% of Republicans want, they're going back on their principles. That is their view in that chamber. If you're wondering what we've been fighting against, this is what it is, which is why I was just so uh, appreciative that they did this interview that we could talk about today. I think you make fair points, but I'm telling you, the last thing the members want is a speaker's race. It's the most miserable thing a, a member of the Texas House can go through is a speaker's race. And so, one, Speaker Feeling has earned the right to be reelected by his members. They feel that way. And more importantly, they don't want to go through the brain damage of doing it. And they want to support their guy. Yeah. And, 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 and the other thing, to your point, when you have all these outside interests, I mean, look, the House, it's what I love about Texas House, and I'm guilty of this. I will cut my own leg off to prove the outside world wrong about I'm right being a House member today. And I think the House members are going to cut their own leg off if they have to. wouldn't be doing that to prove to everyone else telling them we're not sure Dade Phelan's the best guy. They're going to tell them all. I, I, I have to stop it one more time and then we'll I'll, I'll finish this clip. Um, I love how he catches himself because this is what I've told you about the Dade feeling and really the Dennis Bond and speakership. Because remember, Dennis, again, has been one of the main kind of counselors through the legislative process with this Dade feeling speaker team. I mean, Dennis still runs a lot of the Texas House. And he literally goes, I think members will cut their own leg off to prove to everybody that they can keep this sham of a leadership team in place. And then he goes, I don't think it's actually cutting your own leg off. But he actually had to correct himself because the truth is, Dennis knows he does want people to cut their own legs off for them to stay in power. He wants them to cut their own legs off to defend Dustin Burroughs killing dozens of conservative Republican policies in the, in the calendars committee. Dennis is like, you don't understand. That's the way we do it in the Texas house. And if anybody tells you to not do it that way, you cut your own leg off to defend it. That is his view. And that's why a bunch of people lost on Tuesday. Dennis Bonin, Dade Phelan, Dustin Burroughs, Greg Bonin, Will Metcalf, Morgan Meyer. These guys marched these guys into the battle and said, don't care if you get your leg cut off. You prove to these guys that we're right. They picked these fights. Let's finish this up. You can tell them all go to hell. I hope you're right. I hope you're right. But how many we do that is have to die? Like how many? Need, he doesn't members? need us. A no. conversation very much to he be continued, them. especially <laughs> as we head into that May 28th uh, runoff. He doesn't need them. I, I, I will say, okay, if you are listening to this show and you are one of the newly elected members, you need to understand the words that Dennis Bonin just said. Okay. How many new members would have to pull back? I mean, Mark Strom is trying to get to this point he's trying to make before Dennis Bonin interrupts him. How many of these new members need to take this position for Dade not to be able to survive? And Dennis Bonin goes, he doesn't need him. Okay. If you are a conservative activist, a donor, a candidate, Anybody who in any way helped to elect a conservative member to the legislature in any form or fashion, understand what Dennis Bonin just said. We can keep our power. It doesn't matter how many of you there are. He started the interview saying we're going to have like 25 new members. So what Mark Strama is getting to here at the end is like, what if all 25 of them are like, uh, something's going to change? Dennis Bonin's like, we don't need him. Which, by the way, is the way you would talk if you were willing to cut off your own leg, just to let you know. That is 100% the mindset of somebody willing to cut off both of his legs as long as he stays the chairman. Or for his case, he's a registered lobbyist now. So Dennis Bonin's making millions of dollars lobbying these legislators, which is why he needs them to stay in power. Because if you just, if you don't understand how the lobbying world works, you're going to get paid more for the type of access you have. Okay. So a corporation might have 10 lobbyists and the lobbyists getting the most amount of money are the lobbyists with the best access. Okay. 
So if the chair of calendars is pretty much in your back pocket as a lobbyist, you're paid the $10,000 a month retainer. And if this other lobbyist just has some good connections in the Democrat caucus so he can kind of figure out where they're at, he's paid $5,000 a month. So Dennis Bonin is on this. He's just trying to save this fiefdom he's built. And Mark Strama says, well, how many new members have to take a position that's going to maybe change your mind? And Dennis goes, he doesn't need them. He doesn't need any one of them. Dennis is willing to burn this place down. That is where Texas House leadership is. And you know what? I'm grateful that Dennis did this interview, that he signed the contract and had to show up, that he couldn't get out of it, and that he just showed us perfectly, gave us a window into, one, he affirmed everything the Texas Heist says. So if you haven't watched the Texas Heist or listened to the, go watch it. It's on YouTube, Texas Heist, on the Texas Scorecard YouTube channel. Again, most successful documentary in Texas politics history. Go watch it. And know, now that you've listened or watched this show, know that when you watch the Texas Heist, Dennis Bonin just told you everything in that documentary is true. Everything in that documentary is true. So I'm appreciative, former Speaker Bonin, for your willingness to kind of open a lot of people's eyes. And I hope that these new members coming in really take note of, of leadership's posture to you. They don't need you. These guys will go to war. I, I, maybe I call Dennis Bonin like the, the Nikki Haley of the le- like I one thing I said about Nikki Haley the reason I could never vote for her is because she was like in her presidency she wanted to start World War three four and five like in the four years okay she was like I'm going to war with this pe- these people and then I mean heck maybe in the middle of it we'll start war with China or definitely Russia and like if there's anybody else out there that seems bad let's go to war with them too she's just ready to go to war with everybody okay and Dennis Bonin's kind of like that and his kind of crew the, uh, you call them like Bonin disciples. But like the Burroughs, Greg, Cody Harris, you know, uh, some people don't know where Tom Oliverson's at in that. And I don't really know either. I kind of Tom's very close to that group. But in some ways, Tom's maybe not. I don't know. We'll see if you're in Harris County. Different people ask me all the time, who's with who? I'm like, well, sometimes you just it's sometimes hard to peg certain people. But understand. This is their posture, him and all the many disciples under him. We don't need them. I don't care if 25 Republican members come in here that are all brand new, that all want us to stop working with Democrats the way we do. They, he literally says they're going to tell him to go to hell. And they're going to come around our guy. So just a reminder for all of you out there, they're not going away. They're not all saying, oh, let's just go home. Let's just have a Texas house that's now responsive to the people. They're digging in. And that's why these runoffs are important. And that's why the Republican state convention is important. If you haven't applied to be a delegate at the state convention, apply, make plans, come to San Antonio. You have to be there because the moderates are coming in. Dana Myers is running on a platform that's like, I don't want to get involved in the Republican or Republican stuff. She wants to take us back to a moderate do nothing party. If runoffs are in your area, get involved. If runoffs aren't in your area, figure out where they are. There's a bunch of them going on. And no, it doesn't matter how many runoffs are won as far as Dennis Bonin and Dustin Burroughs and Greg Bonin and Jordan Berry and a lot of Jordan Berry's clients, all these people, they don't need you. That's it. That's the mindset, right? Dade Phelan, he doesn't need you. If he can eke out a reelection, he's coming back. He's ready to go to war and start two or three different wars in the Republican Party. It's going to be interesting to watch. We're in a remarkable time in Texas history, and I'm glad that I get to come to you every single week. Thank you for being engaged in the fight. Thank you for not going away. Thank you for staying involved. May God bless you, and may God bless Texas. Do you want to get your news from people who share your values? Texas Scorecard, real news for real Texans.